Transportation Advisory Meeting, December 14th to order and uh, start off with a roll call. All right. Present. I know what's down there now. Jacques Livingston. Present. Liz Oppel. Here. Joe Long. Present. Council Member Chair. Present. Awesome. Thank you. And Sandy's so cool. She's in there twice. I don't Look think you it. called me. Or I didn't hear my name. I'm present. Courtney Michelle. Awesome. Well, why don't we uh, jump to the minutes there? Do we have a a motion to approve uh, uh, the minutes from the October Transportation Advisory Board meeting? I make it. Sandy, I think you were first there. Is there a second? I second. All right, thanks, David. There. Any comments on uh, uh, the meeting minutes? Any corrections? Any concerns? Okay. Hearing none, we'll go for a vote there. All in favor of. Uh, Approving the October minutes, maybe a, a raise your hand so the camera can prep for you there. All right, hold it up just to make sure Stacy has a chance to see it. Great, thank you. Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Awesome. Well, why don't we jump to uh, communications from staff? Neil, thanks. Um, nice to see you all tonight. Uh, Jock, thanks for hopping on there. Um, we've got we've got some presentations lined up for you tonight. Probably some staff you've not seen, and quite frankly, um, I think staff will have a chance to meet some new staff that's joined us recently. So I think Phil's going to do an introduction, and we'll go from there. I think that's all I have for now from staff. Thanks, Tyler, and thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. I just wanted to introduce. Uh, Glenn Van Nimwingen from, uh, he's, he's our new planning director. I wanted to see if he could get the camera on and so we could see him. He's uh, taking the place of, uh, if you know, Joni Marsh. She's been doing kind of two jobs over the last couple of months here. Well, years really, um, planning director and uh, assistant city manager. So we're just so excited to have Glenn come on board and be able to uh, take over the role of planning director for the city. And so, He'll be our person who really goes through the whole piece of going through the different permits and, and the different planning practices that we do through the city. So um, and it looks like he's maybe having some problems with his camera. So um, I just wanted to introduce Glenn and uh, make sure you all got a chance to hopefully meet him before the end of the meeting. Maybe we'll wait for him to um, be able to get into WebEx since I don't think he's used our WebEx system before and it is a, it is kind of different. So, um, but anyway, Glenn's a great new addition to our group and he's been uh, wonderful so far, a couple of weeks here in to, to him being on board. And so uh, we look forward to working with him uh, in the, throughout, throughout, throughout this year and, and many more to come. So thanks, Glenn. I don't know if you can hear us or if you can say anything. I'm gonna guess not. Oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, Glenn. Hey, Glenn. <laughs> I, I just now started hearing what you said, Phil, so I'm sure it was great. I'm glad well, to be here. Um, it, was almost, it was pretty much flawless, Glenn, so <laughs> oh, I was just okay. glowing about how great you I are. I hope I can live up to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, well, I have nothing more to say then. <laughs> well, I just wanted you to. I'm maybe excited to be a part a, of Yeah, if you had a chance just to kind of go over what you'll be doing and 
kind of the role you'll be playing, and then we'll go through just do a quick introduction of folks. Okay. Well, um, this is my second week, so I'm still learning what my role is, but I understand it as um, being the planning director and also in charge of code enforcement um, with the city of Longmont, and uh, thrilled to be here. It seems like uh, I've kind of been preparing to get to this point, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, really thrilled to be part of the team, and I'm excited so, about the transportation planning. So uh, Phil uh, invited me to this meeting as a great overview. Great, Neil, did you want to just introduce yourself quickly and then we'll just go through the group or how do you want to? Sure, that's, uh, that's fine. Very nice to meet you there, Glenn. I'm Neil Leary. I'm the Transportation Advisory Board Chair and uh, been on the advisory board now for two and a half years. Time goes fast, but looking forward to having a chance to work with you. And uh, Wonderful. Doug, since you're our uh, uh, vice chair, why don't you go next? All right, thanks, Neil. Uh, hi, Glenn, uh, Jacques Livingston, uh, vice chair of transportation board. Uh, I've been on the board, boy, this is my second year. The time does go by quick. <laughs> <laughs> I think this teleworking might have something to do with that too. But, um, but yeah, happy to be here and good to meet you. Awesome. David, do you want to uh, uh, follow up there? I think you're on mute, David. Hi, thank you for that. Uh, good to have you, Glenn. I'm Dave Droge. Um, I'm a systems engineer up at uh, Keysight up in Loveland and uh, uh, active cyclist. And I've been on the board for probably, I think, just a little over two years. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Dave. Uh, Sandy and then Courtney and uh, then Joe and, and then Liz. Okay, I'm Sandy Stewart, and I've been on the board a little over a year, and um, I don't have anything else to add, I don't think. <laughs> uh, I'm Courtney Michelle. I've also been on the board just a little over a year, about a year and a half now, and uh, enjoying it greatly, and welcome to welcome to your new role. Hi, Glenn, Joe Long. Um, I, I think I've been on the board about a half a year. Uh, I think to the point, the whole COVID reality has changed. Uh, good to meet you. It's good to meet you, Glenn. Um, I'm Liz Osborne, and I've been on the board as long as Joe came on in July of this year, and so just learning what's going on. Oh, hi, Liz. Awesome. And lastly, Council Member Peck. Hello, welcome aboard and very happy to have you come and join the city. Uh, I've been on council just starting in my second term. So um, I am very interested in transportation and hope that you can stand all of us. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, council member. You too. Awesome. Thank you, Glenn. So nice to have you here. And uh, Phil, anything else before we march forward? That's it. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, are there any members of the public uh, who are visiting us today who have uh, uh, any comments they'd like to share? None. We will uh, march forward. So. We have uh, an action item for today around uh, the, the 2020 Transportation Advisory Board Annual Report, which uh, we were so efficient that it's drafted even before we got here. Tyler, do you want to uh, 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 frame the, the conversation? Sure. So obviously this year has been pretty impacted with, um, with the pandem global pandemic, definitely limited the amount of meetings that we had. Um, each year we talk about beginning of the year, we do a kickoff with things we wish to accomplish throughout the year. There's a handful of things that are um, cyclical that we do on an annual basis, such as the CIP, the upcoming CIP is one of the big important, one of the 
bigger things that we ask to take to the board on an annual basis. As other items come up throughout the year or the board is interested in something, we try to bring those items to you as we can. And one of the requirements of the board is to report to council each year on the work plan and the accomplishments for each year. So this is the, here's the summary of some of the highlights, some of the bigger things we did this year. And then uh, the second sheet is kind of the work plan that we all talked about earlier this year that has the items that we try to cover on an annual basis. And next month, I think a good segue into think about things you'll want to be working on next year. So as we're looking through this and thinking about it, chewing on it, um, think about some of the things on here and we'll talk about next year's work plan at the next meeting. But um, any questions about what's on on here currently and We'll go from there. Yeah, Liz. It's probably just a typo, but when I looked at it and it said including December 4th, 2020, and I had a heart attack that I missed a meeting. Is that a typo? Should be 14th. Should be December 14th, yes. Okay, thank you. Liz, we were all there. Where were you? <laughs> I know. I was like, oh no. <laughs> any other comments on the uh, uh annual report? Tyler, uh, do you need a motion uh, to finalize? Okay. Yeah, we need a motion. Great. Would anybody like to make a motion to uh, approve the uh, the annual report? This is Joe. I'll make a motion to approve the report in its current form. All right. Sounds good. And I saw that Sandy seemed a second there. All right. Uh, any discussion before we do a vote? All, right. All in favor of approving the motion there, raise your hand. All right, <laughs> like there's unanimous support there. Anybody opposed? All right, the motion passes. Thank you, Tyler. All right, so it looks like we're talking about our first and main transit station planning there. Uh, Tony, are you going to be leading the way for us? Hi, uh, Tony Chacon, Redevelopment Manager and Director of Urban Renewal. I was kind of hoping that Phil was going to give me a spectacular introduction, but I don't know. I got to keep him in control more often. So anyway, it's a pleasure meeting you all. I have not met you all uh, previously, uh, except of course, Joan. We've met on several occasions. Um, but what I'm here today to talk about is the uh, progress we are making on the first and, and uh, main transit station. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the RTD process as it related to what was known as the Fast Tracks project, which was supposed to bring rail to um, Longmont uh, sometime in the immediate past, but now we know it's long time into the future. Uh, but with that, RTD had designated $17 million that could be used by the city to, or in conjunction with the city, to start development of the improvements needed to support the transit services in that particular area. Um, just for your information, that $17 million as of today is closer to about $16.2 million because RTD has been in the process of utilizing some of those funds in its planning efforts today. Uh, with that, though, uh, the last couple of years, myself and Phil Greenwald have been in intensive discussions with RTD about the facilities that are to be constructed and to determine what those costs would be accordingly which then will lead the city and RTD into final negotiations in terms of actually constructing these facilities. So uh, the first order of business that has to be concluded before any acquisitions and or improvements can commence is what RTD is referencing as their infrastructure master plan. And what that essentially does, it identifies the preferred location for their facilities. It identifies the costs associated with the possible acquisitions. And then it also identifies the infrastructure that would be needed to support the transit facility itself. So 
that plan is well along. We are we have been advised by RTD that we should be seeing a draft of that plan come the end of the year, which then would lead us to some refinements and then hopefully moving forward with the necessary acquisitions and possibly the improvements sometime next year. So what does the infrastructure master plan include? Uh, there were uh, several primary elements. Number one, again, is the acquisitions. Number two, it includes, or it has been agreed to that there will be a parking structure constructed of which RTD is requiring a minimum of 200 spaces be dedicated to them. And that's that portion of the project for which they would fund. Although they are supportive of the city, increasing the capacity of that to support adjacent development if the city wishes to do so. Um, it, um, the other thing, a component of that structure will be the bus facility. So it has been agreed that the bus facility, which could uh, harbor about 10 buses, would be at the ground level of the parking garage itself. So it would be under shelter. People would actually um, be able to load the buses, unload under sheltered provisions. Um, and then another element of the plan now is Kaufman Street because it has been is planned that access or bus access to the facility will have to come off of Kaufman Street, which is to be extended from where it currently ends at First Avenue down to Boston. And then that facility is to be designed to allow for commingled use of both vehicle, uh, standard or regular vehicles and the buses themselves. So I think Phil is, or you are aware of the Kaufman Street Multimodal project to the north. It will differ slightly from that section in that that section will have dedicated bus lanes. This section will not have dedicated bus lanes. Um, as I mentioned, it will um, multimodal. That section also will be multimodal in that it will also incorporate improvements uh, to uh, facilitate bicycle movements as well as pedestrian movements. And right now the plan is there would actually be dedicated bicycle laneage as part of that project. And then the uh, last component of the infrastructure master plan is effectively all the supporting infrastructure. So the area is totally devoid of water infrastructure, sanitary infrastructure and storm facilities. And all of those will have to be constructed in conjunction with the improvements that I just previously noted. So, um, again, we are looking forward to getting hopefully that draft of the IMP by the end of this year, and then that will lead us to moving forward with the improvements or more importantly is the negotiations at that point, because uh, right now there is discussion as to who is going to be responsible both for the acquisitions and the construction of the facilities. The preference at this time is the city, if it has the capability and willingness, would actually be the party to pursue both acquisitions and the improvements. But we will be having that conversation with the city council, hopefully uh, come January, February at the latest on that matter. Um, so, uh, that is pretty much the update on the transit project, uh, the first domain transit project. We are also going to be coordinating to ensure that the Kaufman Street project and this particular project are integrated with a smooth transition. And that will be forthcoming when we get closer to final design on the uh, Kaufman Street section of the particular project. Um, I also provided, and I do believe that you should have received some images and uh, I don't know if um, Tyler, are you around? Possibly, do you yeah, have to possibly share? I sure can. Quick? 
sick. Let's go through this real quick. So what you received is a packet showing some examples of how we would like to see the development. What we are proposing is that the parking garage actually would be wrapped by residential and or commercial development, a mixed use project. We have been talking to prospects in regards to that, and this just represents just one vision of what possibly could happen at that particular location. So we'll go through them real quick. This is a slide if you're looking to the southwest at Main and First. Next. So as you noticed on that last and this particular slide, this the previous slide, basically you do not see the transit facility. It would have ground floor commercial. This slide shows what it would look like along, possibly look like along Kaufman Street. And as you note there on the ground floor, you can see the bus facility that is embedded into the development project itself. Next. This kind of gives you an area view of how the parking garage would work in relationship to the development. Just another angle. And this actually is a section of Main Street showing a midpoint crossing where there would be a portal where you could get to the bus terminal without having to go to either First Avenue or Boston, you could actually enter at midpoint in the development itself. And that's just another perspective of what that might look like. Next, that might be it. So Tony's getting rid of all the traffic on Maine, which is nice too. Just kidding. Well, under this uh, scenario, apparently we don't have parking either, but part of the plan would to be to reinstate parking on both Main Street and also provide par on street parking along Kaufman Street. So that just gave you a perspective of what we would like to achieve from a city standpoint. We believe it's very important that we don't end up with a standalone parking garage especially in the redevelopment area around 1st and Main. Our interest is really stimulating new development activity, and we believe that this particular project could uh, basically serve as a catalyst in conjunction with the South Main Station project that was more recently completed to really view the progress of development in that corridor there. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. David, I think you were first there. He's on mute. You can unmute yourself. I'm looking at the uh, the slot. One of the any of the slides that are uh, looking down where it shows the railroad tracks. Yes. And I I thought that this was going to somehow incorporate uh, the railway, uh, but it looks like it's completely separate. Is that true? You mean the, the future rail track? Right. Yes. yes. The, so a couple of factors. First of all, we are looking to locate this uh, bus facility and the park commuter parking garage in close proximity where RTD would intend the rail service. Right now, the plan would be if and when, I shouldn't say if, when, they bring rail to Longmont. The actual loading platforms would be immediately east of the Kaufman Street improvement. I mean, sorry, west of Kaufman Street. Right, right there at that intersection. So effectively, persons would be able to walk right across the street to the rail. I see. I think Tyler's okay. bringing it back up so you can see where the future rail station is up on that right side. Right. And then that's part of kind of that whole loading area for the tr for the rail and how it incorporates back to the parking garage as well. Yeah, so there's a proximity that RTD has to have for the future rail to be close to this station as well. So uh, we worked with them on that as to, to try to get that proximity. And, and this, so, th this slide shows First Avenue going west. 
Yeah. Actually, when the rail comes, they would occupy those lanes that are currently vehicular lanes. That's I see. So the rail station would come right up to the tracks. Yes. Right. The okay. rail actually comes brand comes off of the tracks for the commuter portion and it ends right in front of this potential rail station right before Kaufman Street. We didn't want to block Kaufman Street with the rail because we need that for our bus rapid transit section. So and I'll be talking okay. about that in the next segment. Uh, when we talk about Kaufman Street. Okay, and at this point, all of both the road, the railroad and the bus transit are all considered at the same grade. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, and we, we don't know the final design on the rail platform itself yet. I mean, that's to be determined at such time they get to that point. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. Great, thanks. It looks like Sandy had a question. Neil, if I could just jump uh, in. I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious to know if we know, have any idea how much it's going to cost and how it's going to be paid for. I mean, the $17 million or 16.2 is not going to take it. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. So the, the, like I mentioned, the infrastructure master plan is giving us some cost estimates. The preliminary numbers that we received a few weeks back or a couple weeks back are that um, it's going to be in the range of about 23 million total. So if you took out 17, we're effectively looking at the city would have to bring uh, or identify six to seven million of, of resources to cover that differential. Now, there the other factor is though, if we were to put, build additional parking spaces in addition to the 200, that's an additional cost on top of that. However, that's one reason it's important to pursue a development project because they would be able to use those spaces and then pay for those, help pay for those spaces. So the final numbers, um, we don't know exactly. The city will have to make a significant contribution but hopefully we'll be looking at a variety of funding mechanisms. Uh, we could look at, uh, you know, capital improvement funds, uh, the, just the CIP program. We're gonna be looking at just uh, general bond issues possibly. And then another avenue is actually through the Urban Renewal Authority and its ability to utilize what was referred to as tax increment funds. And that's that's effectively the taxes that are generated by a new development project. I have a quick question. Does that estimate uh, include forecast or potential overage, or is that kind of a net the twenty three million? So include like a contingency? Yeah. Yeah. Right now, that that includes a contingency of some sort. The other factor at this time is those numbers are premised or we believe they're premised on RTD building the facilities. And just for your information, RTD, they adhere to strict federal requirements and guidelines regardless where the funding source comes from. So there's a tendency that those federal requirements actually increase costs sometimes. So we'll be looking at other avenues, that's, part of that discussion of who takes this project on, because there are other avenues that might help us bring that cost down a little bit. Would RTD be uh, uh, a lessee in this environment? Yeah, so yeah. what happened is they would, well, they would contribute that 17 million thereabouts in total towards the project. With that, they would get a dedicated easement for 200 parking spaces and the parking garage, but at at no cost other than annual operations and maintenance. Great, Thank thanks. you. Liz? Related, related to that, um, there has been rumors, not rumors, but mumblings about a divorce of RTD and Longmont for some time. And if that divorce took place, who would get custody of this building? is what I was wondering. 
Well, to tell you the truth, we haven't really looked at the legal ramifications of a scenario like that, but maybe Phil can fill you a little bit more about where things are heading. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the kid in this scenario is this is this transit station. So we need to make sure that everybody's contributing to the to the child in this relationship. So um, that that station will get built. That, that money is promised. We're not talking about actively removing ourselves from RTD per se, but we are talking about a different way of governance. And uh, uh, and one thing to think about is the RTD would still control the regional trips, the train, the bus rapid transit piece. We want to look at how Longmont can be more, take a more active partnership in the way that the local buses are run. So that's kind of the, it's not really a divorce as much as it's, uh, you know, Talking about who does different roles and how do we, how do we maybe share share the, the different chores more evenly? That's probably a good thing for us to have in the 2021 work plan, so we can dig into that a little more detail. But when the time's right. Okay. Um, yeah, Cindy. I'm just curious of what current businesses are going to be impacted by building this transit station. Oh. Are you talking in regards to the acquisitions? Yes. Yes. Okay. Until the IMP is released, we don't have any specific properties, but any acquisitions that those businesses would be worked with for basically either relocation or some kind of compensation. So it's not a matter of where the businesses are just rudely kicked out of the premises. Either RTD or the city, and my perspective, I think the city is a little more sensitive to those needs mm -hmm. that we would work with those businesses accordingly. Thank you. Great. I know we're going to be um, chatting about the Kaufman Street uh, activities, which obviously uh, directly relates to uh, uh, to this there. So uh, before we do additional Q&A there, Phil, uh, did you want to uh, give an update on the Kaufman Street uh, planning and, and then we can kind of dig into the, the intersection of, of the two? Sure, what I'd like to do is just share briefly this, uh, this presentation. It should be fairly quick, I'm hoping. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Yep. Great. So I think many of you have heard about the Coffin Street Busway Corridor. And it's, it's, this is really the design aspect of that whole piece of the project right now. So what we're talking about it's a $750,000 project. It is part of a $6.9 million total overall project costs. And I'll go through that a little bit at the end of the slideshow. But I just wanted to quickly talk about this because we're we're actually going to kick off the project tomorrow. So we do have a consultant on board. I can say it's OTAK, O-T-A-K. Uh, they're out of Louisville, great company. And so we're really excited to work with them over the next 16, 18 months on the design of Kaufman Street. So that starts tomorrow. We'll start the, the funding flow tomorrow, and I'll show you some more about that. You know Kaufman Street now because, you, you know, we live it. Um, I don't know if many of us have been out. Uh, lately, but uh, you, you certainly have, you certainly, most people know about Kaufman Street, one block west of Main Street. We're talking about from 1st to 9th, basically, actually the whole thing, will, the whole project will go up to 11th for buses, um, but the, the bulk of the construction piece is going to be from 1st to 9th Avenue on Kaufman Street. And so right now we have the walkways that are pretty, pretty narrow. We have a pretty wide tree lawn for most of it, and we have the parking uh, it's both diagonal. You'll see the diagonal on the left side and on the right side, you see the parallel parking. So that parking width varies. There's also very wide lanes for, for automobile traffic and a very wide center turn lane as well. So that all fits within about 100 feet of existing right of way today. <clears throat> what we plan to do is, and this is may, this may not be the final look of this, but this is the, the initial design, the, the kind of um, the, the very pre Pre, the, the very early work on design here is to talk about at some point we need to have bus lanes as part of this project. And those have been envisioned for the center of the roadway. We also have to do uh, separated bike lanes. And so those are spikes, bike lanes that will actually be probably vertically separated from the roadway. They'll actually 
probably be up at the sidewalk level. But again, depending on how much the design goes through. And we're talking about maintaining the same number of travel lanes. So nothing will change as far as the existing traffic and the, the capacity for that traffic. And then we want to accommodate, obviously, the trees and the parking that, that some parking and, and uh, you'll see that up on the very top of the slide there. Uh, parallel parking uh, where we can fit it and then really treat, keep the tree canopy and some of that uh, more um, that, that the green look in the corridor that we have today, but it's kind of hodgepodge and mixed up throughout the corridor. And we have some really great places where it's green. And this is really trying to keep the uh, tree canopy throughout the corridor. And then again, enhance those pedestrian connections, which are about four feet. They kind of vary from four to eight feet right now. We want to make that consistent along the corridor. So those are the things we're trying to do. This is really starting obviously in 2020 at the very end here. So we're, we're just, we're just fitting it in. We're still hoping to complete it by mid 2022. Uh, we'd really like to get construction going soon thereafter once we're done with the design, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of issues with that as far as when you want to do your timing for going out to bid on for, for construction projects and things like that. So we're trying to be cognizant of that, uh, and then we try to try to say that opening day will hopefully be uh, in later later 2023 or early 2024. But again, that's a pretty aggressive schedule, so uh, we'll have to talk about that as well. Uh, the funding sources, again, this is all going back to a. Uh, Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog, as it's affectionately known, um, and a TIP Transportation Improvement Pro Project or Program Award that we won by being going out to a competitive process with the rest of the region. Uh, again, we got $750,000 for the final design. We got just over $6 million for construction. So total uh, project costs were $6.9 million total. You'll see the, the city's matching dollars, which um, is, is, is pretty low amount, one, $150,000 to get, you know, basically 6.7 million, seven and a half million dollars, um, 6.75, 6.75 million dollars. Anyway, that's it for my presentation. I want to be quick. I wanted to get you guys to allow you to do some questions. So with that, um, I'm going to try to stop sharing here and, uh, uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about these projects together, as you mentioned, Neil. Great. Thank you. Well, while uh, folks can ponder their questions, one initial question I had, Phil, um, is from the image of uh, the cutaway from the street, it looked like there was a five-foot bike lane. Does that include a three-foot gutter, a uh, drainage gutter, uh, um, or is that in addition to the, the roadway gutter? Well, again, what we'd like to do with the bike lane is actually elevate it to the same Elevation is the sidewalk. So you'd actually have a sidewalk, a tree lawn, and then the bikeway, and then drop into the street level with uh, parallel parking in some areas, and then the street continues into, into the different lanes that you saw. So what we're really trying to do is, whether it's gonna be a, a buffer with some delineation between the buffer and the moving traffic, or if it's gonna be up above at the same grade as the sidewalk, we'd really like to separate that bikeway so that there's a comfort level and a level of stress that's very low. That sounds great there and just follow up on that. So if you're traveling south on Kaufman, I, uh, as I recall from um, the documents that, that Tony was walking through earlier, um, the bike lane does not continue at first in, in Maine there. It basically turns into a bike path, I'm assuming on the east side of, of the road, if I have that right. And if that is indeed the case, um, how do cyclists get from, uh, if they're heading south there, from the southbound bike lane to the uh, the bike path on, on the east side of the street? Well, what we're really trying to do with this whole bikeway is connect the St. Vrain Greenway on the south all the way through downtown to the bike lanes on 11th uh, that, that go across town actually quite a ways. So, um, your question is getting into some serious design issues that we still need to work through with the final design. But right now we have RTD wanting to keep all the bike facilities. So they'll do a two lane or a two way bike facility on the west side of Kaufman. And we need to either transition that into a one, one bike way on each side of Kaufman as I've shown it in my presentation, 
or it may continue on the west side of Kaufman as a two-way kind of cycle track that would go all the way up the corridor that way. So we're still working with the design on that, but it would either have to transition into two pieces coming together on the west side of Kaufman in front of the bus station, because we don't want to, we don't want those bicyclists getting into any turn conflicts with buses. That's just, RTD doesn't want it, we don't want it. And so it's a safety, it's a big safety issue. So we need to kind of work that through the design process. Thanks. Any follow-up questions for folks? Yeah, Liz. Um, as I looked at those pictures, I realized you're doing design still, um, but eliminating the center turn lane coming through southbound, a lot of parking is on the east side of Kaufman Street. So if you're coming southbound, where would you would you block traffic to make that turn into all the parking? That's well. Sorry, go, go ahead. No, I'm, that was the end of the question. Uh, as far as the preliminary design goes, we did eliminate that. It appears that we've eliminated that move, but again, design will will dictate what actually ultimately happens in that section. I do what that multiple times a week, so I'm right. like, I like, I know that one. So. Yeah. So what we'd like to do is, um, you know, we're really trying to keep people out of those bus lanes, but we don't even know if they'll be in the center or not, or where they'll be located. Mm -hmm. But the idea is maybe you could use. Um, you know, use the bus lane for turning traffic in the direction that's not the, not the, not the primary flow, you know, not the primary mm -hmm. direction of travel for the buses, but we really like to keep the buses kind of separated out and not mix that in. So um, there's going to be some issues as far as how do we get turning traffic into those parking lots? You're right. And so that's been brought up a number of times by the downtown development authority. So they are, they are on it. They're watching okay. that for okay. you. <laughs> and so are we. And we just want to make sure it's safe again. Sounds good. Yeah, Sandy, and did I see Jacques had a question there as well? Okay. So I, I, I may be um, confused, but when the buses are coming up uh, north on 287 or Main Street and, and the new um, parking structure is built, they'll be turning uh, left. Are we not going to be having any buses go from 1st to 9th or 11th Street up Main Street? That's a great question and it's one that we get again from a number of folks who are kind of concerned about that. What we're what we're saying is we think that there may be local bus service. It's still, you know, the smaller buses that that run on Main Street, but the idea is to really and we're going to talk about this in the next these all these issues kind of play off of each other. We're going to talk about the capacity on Main Street, what happened with the, with the lane closures. And one of the things that we found was we took all the buses during those lane closures, we took all the buses off of Main Street so that there wasn't any buses stopping traffic on Main Street. And that kept that capacity open for vehicles and kept, kept the traffic moving, which was great. So um, that's what we're trying to do here too. We're trying to keep their safety issues with, you know, people opening doors and a bus coming by and Buses stopping in traffic and people having to pass in that in that in, inside lane. So we're trying to pull as many buses as we can off into the Coffin Street corridor, but that's not to say we might not have a local bus uh, using Main Street. But the idea is really trying to move that traffic off that bus traffic off of Main Street onto Kaufman. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Uh, yeah, so let's take a couple questions here, um, and I and I actually support the moving the buses uh, one block west on Kaufman Street. I think having the buses uh, detoured during this last little time actually contributed to having a comfortable downtown. Um, I actually enjoyed it a lot. Uh, so anyways, that's just a comment. So first question on the Kaufman reroute, how much have we looked at the study on the train crossing? I know I brought this up earlier and I have lots of uh, memories of taking that morning bus and sitting at that crossing on Main Street for 10, 15, 20 minutes um, as a big freight train is coming across. And I'm looking at the plan here and I'm seeing buses and a potential rail and like a lot more traffic. That just kind of concerns me a little bit. I could see a huge snarled mess there as we wait 20 minutes for a train to clear. So that's one of the things. And then also I just wanted to check in on a Boston um, update over on Hover. Are we still planning to do that to bring it over? 
um, all the way across the tracks. Uh, just wondering if that was still the, the plan as well. Great. We'll give a we'll give a heads up to Jim Engstadt just to get ready for that second question now that you had. But the first question, and maybe Tyler can help me with it a little bit, is, you know, we really are looking at. I mean, that's going to be a big piece of this project, and it might be a might be a pretty, you know, big ball of wax that, that we we're going to have a tough time working with the railroad as far as what goes on as far as a crossing at first and 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 Kaufman. We've had the similar issues at first and Emory, and, and it hasn't been pleasant, quite frankly, but. Um, what we're thinking of doing, uh, and what we've talked about RTD, and they do this today, is if there's a train blocking the track and it's a and it's one that's going to take some time, we're really going to ask RTD to divert and go over Pratt, South Pratt Parkway and come back to Boston that way and get back into the, you know, bus station that way and the other the other direction as well. The northbound direction could be the same way as uh, we may have some um, intelligent traffic signals that help, you know, route buses. When there is such a long blockage, we could we could actually put in some, you know, you know, some 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 detour, some temporary detour signage, electronic signage that would help buses get around that. So there's a bunch of different things we've been thinking about with that. So great point. Um, the same thing would happen at Boston. Quite frankly, it's going to be an at grade crossing in the future. That's the that's the vision of it right now. And I'll let Jim talk a little bit more about where Boston is as far as connecting across the tracks. Good evening, Jim Anstad, Director of Engineering Services. Uh, in response to Phil's question, um, the uh, Boston Avenue Crossing project uh, has been stalled a little out due to COVID, some staffing issues, but it, we are still working on it. Uh, we have been um, working with the property owner, uh, some preliminary negotiations on property acquisition, as well as some preliminary design. Um, but we anticipate getting some more traction this year as we get, or it should say into next year into 2021. Um, so uh, that is, does continue to move forward. It is, it is in the budget and will continue to be so until we, uh, we get it done. Thanks, Jim. Great. Thanks. Any other follow up clarifying questions? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Tony, for the update earlier. Yes, um, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, I think next in the information item list there is for the Main Street lane closures, which sounds like ties on in there. So uh, Tyler and Phil, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, thanks for letting me share with you tonight. I've got some information to share on Main Street lane closures, some of the traffic data and some of the delays we saw. And then Phil, chime in as you wish. I'll try and I've got some slides to share and talk about and kind of kind of debrief on the experience, what we saw, what we learned, and maybe some talk about some next steps. I can share. Hold on. All right. So obviously Main Street lane closures. We started this. We started closing lanes in uh, first part of July, and it was primarily in response to as businesses were allowed to reopen throughout the pandemic, uh, a lot of them were restricted to capacity of about 50% of normal. And so in, it was really a collaborative effort working with business owners with LDDA, coming up with an idea of how do we support some of the, the downtown area and get more people out and provide more opportunities to, to keep businesses alive. Um, we talked about, we ended up closing lanes, talking about closing lanes. We set the Jersey barriers and took one lane of traffic in each direction on Main Street. And, and that wasn't a straightforward process. I talk about the collaboration with CDOT and FHWA. Obviously, Main Street's a state highway. So we need a state permit. We need state approvals to do this. And the other thing that came up during this was from, from FHWA. The other little wrinkle was uh, being a, a federal highway owned route. It runs from Mexico all the way up to the Canada border, 287 does in, in certain alignments. But um, one of the clauses they have in there is compensation for use of right of way. So that was one of the big hurdles that we had to to work through. And and I think CDOT was a big help in getting a temporary waiver of that requirement as we were able to close the lanes on Main Street. So um, 
really, really good effort of or good collaboration between all those jurisdictions working together. And quite frankly, in a relatively short time, I think we started talking about closing lanes on Main Street late in June, and we're able to pull it together and implement early July. And so with that said, with the compressed timeline that we had, we really wanted to try and measure what traffic impacts would be. I think we heard from some of the neighborhoods, particularly the east side neighborhood and, and some on the west about where is traffic going to go? If you're closing lanes on Main Street, it's going to divert. And how, how bad is that going to be? How much is that going to impact me? And it was a good opportunity for us to, for the city to try this. I think there's been discussion over the years of can we close a lane on Main Street? Do we really need four travel lanes on Main Street? So from that angle, it was a good opportunity for us to, to actually try it and see what it looks like in implementation. So early on, we were able to, to get a slew of counts done before we started implementing the lane closures. And hindsight being 2020, I wish I'd had a little bit more time to get more counts and a better and more data, but we did the best we could with the, with the time we had. Um, each each count, each red line you see on here is a tube count where we did a before lane closures on Main Street, a during the lane closures on Main Street, and then a follow-up after we've taken the barricades off. I will note the further north one, um, Main Street north of Long's Peak is, a, is an automated count. It's one through the loop detectors we have at the signal, so I'm able to get every day, a pretty good data set of every day of what happened. So. That's outside of where we had the lane closures, but you'll definitely see the impacts of how traffic volume was impacted on Main Street from the lane closures. In general, we saw traffic volumes on Main Street drop about 3,000 vehicles per day, uh, 25, 22, 21,000 vehicles per day. And I think, you know, Phil touched on it in the previous discussion, talking about capacity and getting the buses out of the lane. So why didn't and we we think and and we we hear that Main Street is congested congested and backed up and really bad in normal times. How could we possibly consider closing a lane on Main Street? It's going to be going to be a nightmare. Well, I think the reality of what we saw through Carmageddon. What's that? I think it's called Carmageddon. Car Carmageddon. <laughs> you know, I I don't think that really came to fruition. Um, obviously, I think volumes were impacted by. People still staying at home from the pandemic, so it's maybe not a, a full on uh, controlled case where we have a control. Um, there were a lot of variables in this one rather than just one control or one variable. Um, but part of what we saw is taking those lanes away. We didn't lose 50% of the capacity of the roadway. It wasn't cut in half. And why is that? We look at what what are the what are the slow points? What what impedes traffic as you travel up and down Main Street? A lot of it is those buses that you mentioned. So every time those buses stop, they're blocking that that outside lane, both north and southbound. So that takes away some of that capacity from that outside lane. We also have the parallel parking there on Main Street, and, and I know I, I've definitely stopped for people to to park there before. So as someone's trying to navigate a a parallel parking stall, that that'll impede your capacity or reduce your capacity of that lane. And so all of that together, I think getting the buses moved off of Main Street, getting rid of that parking there really, really helped provide for some of that free, free, free flow capacity in the through lane we had. And so what do the volumes look like? Real quick before I move on, the volumes, we, I said Main Street was down about 3,000. It had the biggest impact. When we look at the side streets, both Kaufman and Kimbark, they were up a couple hundred cars a day. Um, Order of magnitude is is relatively small there in the two to three thousand, two to three thousand vehicles per day. So I get ten percent, but two hundred out of two thousand I think is still well within a capacity of of both of those streets. One of the other things we saw in Kaufman, I think Kaufman the the after counts were impacted by some of the construction going on um, with the Boulder County project up there on sixth. We did see some apparent increases in traffic over on the east on Emory Street. Um, after the lanes were closed, the one of the things we noticed with that was the day the follow-up count that during the lane closure was done was also the day that the library reopened for um, public access. So I think that definitely skewed that, that change as well. But again, still well within a capacity of, of that roadway. I mentioned the the traffic data recorder that we've got on Main Street north of Long's Peak. And this is a 
daily volume graph back going back to March 1st. And I think it's really interesting. You can see the impacts of, of everything, all the events that happened. So over on the left, March, this is pre-pandemic. I think we had our first cases of COVID reported around March 5th in Colorado. And so if I take data to the left, it's not on this. It looks a lot the same, about 25,000 on average for the week. And then as COVID cases started being reported in Colorado, we really saw a pretty big decline in volume on Main Street. It was about, not quite half, but 55% um, 55, 55 of normal volumes down on Main Street. And then as each stage of the reopening happened, you can see traffic kind of came back to normal. And even when it came back, this is easier after all the restrictions are lifted over here. Um, stay at home orders were, were taken off. Traffic kind of leveled out still around the 22, 23,000 vehicles per day, which is still lower than a normal day. And then I don't know if you can see my pointer here on your screens is that coming through. So, so right here, this is the transition. This is when we put the lane closures on main street. So de definitely you can see where that volume was impacted even north of Long's Peak and it, and it stayed the same throughout. Um, over here, November, let's see, November 3rd is when we finally pulled all the barricades. We had a transition phase where we took out most of the barricades, but left some of them in, both a half block northbound and half block southbound to some of those businesses adjacent to there had an interest in expanding or extending the time that they were able to use that space. So um, November 3rd is when all that, all of the barricades were removed. And it's been interesting even since then, we're seeing a bit of a, general downward trend in traffic. Obviously, some of that's from the Thanksgiving holiday that's kind of influencing that. When I talked earlier about wishing I had a bigger picture of data, I was looking at other tools I have in place. What else, where else can I pull counts off of? And, and some of the arterials I was looking at to see if I could find a measurable, where did that 3,000 trips a day go? Where, where are they at? And quite frankly, they're not really showing up on the other, other arterials. When I look at Pace Street, similar, the same time frame. Again, we see very similar patterns where the stay at home orders, stay at home, home orders go into place, volumes drop and then kind of come back. Um, I can't really say there's a noticeable spike. Maybe a little bit up on average in, in that second week of July. Same with airport, airport road. Again, similar from a big drop when the pandemic came and then it, all the traffic came back and it's been relatively stable since then. One of the things we also measured was travel times. So that was pretty important, even though the capacity is down. Are we, are we that Carmageddon I mentioned before? Are we seeing major delays show up on Main Street because of this? So we were measuring travel times between First and Ninth Avenue on Main Street, both north and southbound, throughout the day through the a.m., noon, and p.m. peak hours. I think where we really saw the biggest increase in delay was northbound in the p.m. peak. We saw an extra minute of delay, so about four minutes. Travel time from third and main, well, first and main up to ninth and main, but really where that delay was coming in was at third, third and main. So I think that would be an opportunity if we're looking at how do we do this again in the future and how do we make it work better? I think that would be an area to focus would really be third and main. Southbound, quite frankly, we didn't really see a lot of increase in travel time southbound through any part of the day. It was pretty consistent about three minutes from ninth down to first throughout the duration of the lane closure before and after as well. Uh, LDDA shared some information here in terms of pedestrian counts that they were counting on both east and west sidewalks of Main Street. And what you're seeing here is just a comparison. It, it's not an actual number, but a comparison of pedestrians on the sidewalk, pedestrian activity year over year. So it looks like um, their first data point was probably in May. I wouldn't think too much about this or think of this as a decline. That's probably just where they started their started their zero at. So I think this is sort of misleading, showing a decline here. I think this is probably where the data starts. And really, at data going back, it's probably more of a extrapolated line to the left or line to the left here. But one of the things I think you'll see July is when we put those lane closures in place. And I think we're really seeing DDA work hard to have some additional activities to get people out and about and utilizing the space. And we actually did see some increase in pedestrian activity for most of September, parts of August and October. 
what did it cost? Um, city spent a little over $98,000 all said and done trying to get those barricades out there. The, the rental of the barricades was not the most expensive part. It was the labor for shipping, the, the hauling them out here and setting them and then picking them back up was a, a lion's share of the cost. We did get some reimbursements from CDOT. I think, Phil, if you can, you may have some more information to share about the grants and, and what the names are, but we did get some reimbursement from, from CDOT for this. And LDDA also expended money on this. I'd, ask, I'd reach out to them for some costs and I, I hadn't heard back yet, but um, I know they spent money in buying some tables, some furniture for the street, and then they also paid to remove or to clean the barricades after they were painted. So they allowed businesses or artists to paint the barricades if they wanted to. One of the conditions was they had to be cleaned before they were returned back to the, um, to the owner of the barricades. So they spent money on cleaning them for sure. I think we've seen I don't have the full picture yet in terms of did it or did it not help businesses. I think anecdotally, I think I know Phil and I talked to a couple of business owners who said that they had to add some staff and add additional shifts to cover um, the demand that they were seeing during the closures. So I think there were definitely some that had saw an improvement and really utilized the space well and benefited from it. I don't know that that was across the board, but I don't have the final tax numbers or the the final data to show that again phil i don't know if you have anything else on that but yeah we just don't have the information at this time for you know we don't have all the receipts and everything from um from from all of that so we we hope to kind of complete this whole report um and i, I think people are going to ask us to take it on the road as well so tyler and i may be presenting this uh, in other locales here if we once things open up again but uh i think people are really interested to find out yeah, how much what how what was the impact to the businesses and we'll know that we'll know that in a few hopefully by the end of this year or so i'd say similar in terms of the crash analysis i'd like to run some numbers on crashes and do a comparison of kind of year over year did we see did we see any increase or even reductions in crashes i think that overall again back to the anecdotal data i think that we heard from the general consensus was that it was a positive experience. I think people enjoyed using the space. I think crossing Main Street seemed probably easier to most and that um, those mid-block crossings, you're only crossing one lane of traffic instead of multiple. So I think that was a benefit to the pedestrians that were out. And then I will also say, I think that, you know, as we look at the future, where does this go? Is this, I think there's desire from DEA and potentially businesses to, to look at, can we do this again next year? I think we're definitely facing a recovery going into next year. So there will probably be um, requests or desire to do something similar. And even further than that, is this something that, that the city would want to consider on a, a, a permanent basis? It might, might be too early to know that, but just kind of planting the question out. And Tyler, but if you, I could, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Anything else to add, Phil? That I yeah, I just just to kind of just to finish up on Tyler's thoughts here is is that uh, you as the TAB members and city council certainly get information all the time about from folks who are worried about growth in the community and whether the roads can whether the streets in Longmont can handle it. And I think what we proved here to some extent was that our roadways really do still have a lot of capacity in them, and so. Main Street certainly isn't always full, and there's nothing we're going to be able to do to ever widen this section of Main Street to, you know, to three lanes or four lanes, certainly, uh, you know, in each direction, because they're, that would just ruin the character of our city, right? So, so whenever you get these people who come in and start talking about impacts to traffic because of a development, our roadways really do have a lot of capacity to give, and we have ways, you know, if, if there really is a situation where we do need to move the traffic better, uh, there are, we have tools in the tool belt to be able to figure out how to do that. And we can, we can make some adjustments like we did with, uh, with Main Street. So just, just to kind of set it into the bigger, you know, citywide aspect of, um, you know, growth and traffic and all these different things that are all uh, being, being kind of pushed upon you as a board member. I'm sure you get the question a lot about why can't you just widen this road? We believe we have capacity in, in our road system today 
to be able to handle road, roadway traffic in the future. So, uh, and and this kind of this kind of illustrates that at some level. So, thank you. Awesome. Thanks to you both. Bill, this is Joe. Quick question. Pardon my ignorance. Um, what is the definition, or how is capacity measured? When you say road capacity, well, well, usually it's it's how many vehicles can you get per lane? And Tyler can help me out with this because he's much more brilliant about this stuff than I am. But it's really about how many uh, how many vehicles per lane you can you can deliver in an in a in a typical hour. And, and usually it's only at rush hour that you see it's like twenty two to twenty six hundred vehicles per lane per hour that you can do. And, and that was measured in like Dallas, Texas on one of their freeway systems. So really that's that's just bumper to bumper, moving fairly slowly, moving traffic through, still moving traffic um, and those things. What we kind of say in the transportation planning world is who would really sit for that, right? Who's really going to, especially along Main Street or any of our streets in Longmont, what we say is people will either find, and this is what we saw with the lane closures, people will either find a different way to travel, like they'll walk or they'll bike or they'll take a bus. And even with COVID, the people were taking buses, uh, you know, during this, and they, and they still are, people who need to travel by bus. But people will find a different way or they'll find a different time of day to travel or they'll find a different route. And that's what we were concerned about was people finding those different routes and really impacting the neighborhoods. And we didn't see that. So we did see some, we did see some growth in traffic, but all three of those things kind of worked in combination where people were able to find, and a lot of people were working at home too. So that's that's kind of either a different route that they weren't they weren't taking any route or they a different mode that they were working at home. So all those different things played into kind of keeping this from being what we called karma garden. <laughs> Thank you for that. Awesome. Yes, Andy. So, Tyler, thank you for that report. It was really good. Um, I just wonder if we're going to have pushback from the, the the state because it is a state highway to think about continuing to do this. You know, this year COVID's still here, but in the future, do you think that that the state will allow us something like that? To continue, would we need a variance, or I don't know what you'd call it, but so I don't know if they'd allow us to do that. Sure, that that's a great question and one that we're not one hundred percent sure on yet either. I, I've asked the question to, to to the region to the region traffic engineer and said, "Hey, this is something we're trying." Obviously, they were involved in in the per process. They're interested in the data that we put together on it as well. And I even mentioned that, that hey, this might be something that the city's asking for in the future, or or maybe even contemplating on a permanent basis. And the response at the time was, well, we've we've definitely done some lane reductions or reduced lanes on some streets in, in the state, but we've never done one on a street of this high a volume. So I didn't get a, a direct or a clear answer as in a yes or a no, but but I think that we've we definitely have some follow-up discussions and some some more data to share with CDOT based on this, if that's a direction that, that we want to go with it. Great, thanks, Jacques. I think you were next. There's the mute button. Uh, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, I guess anecdotal. I'll just say it was a very pleasant experience to go down there with the, the single lanes of traffic. So I, I echo basically everything that was shared. Uh, I was just curious, Tyler, I know you needed more data and you wanted to go back and look. I heard airport pace. Kimbar Kaufman, I didn't hear Hover. Do we know any, did it spill over to Hover at all? Yeah, so I was checking detectors on Hover and unfortunately the only detector I had on Hover was not really working well. I didn't get good data that I felt comfortable sharing. It was, it was pretty intermittent, so I didn't have a good data set to share on that one. I think a couple of the streets that I'd be interested in doing some further investigation would be Martin and Sunset. Yeah, I would echo that. And I think just from my experience, Hover did seem a little bit more, but not consistently. So, yeah, but that that would be where I would think a lot of people would shortcut all of Maine to go all the way up to 66 and then continue north or 17th. 
Great. I take sunset all the time there. I didn't notice any significant shift um, for that, that period, but uh, um, keep your ears open on that. Uh, one last question there, then I'll go to, uh, uh, to David there. Um, as you were, what was that question? <laughs> David, we'll go to you and then I'll come back to me and I'll think of it. Okay. Um, so I have some anecdotal information. So, um, so I've spent part of every Saturday for the last four years at 6th and Main. And uh, I can tell you that the traffic has changed or did change during the time that the uh, barriers were up. Um, before the barriers were up, there was never, I don't ever remember seeing even once traffic backed up to 6th Avenue. After the barriers were up, it could easily back up to Long's Peak. And I may, so there still might be four, four minute time. I don't know how long it took them to get through it, but, uh, but they were easily backed up. They were always backed up to sixth. Cars were, cars were literally stopping at sixth and waiting a cycle or two before they could move across and continue on uh, south of sixth. Um, I don't know what was happening, of course, south of Maine. Uh, excuse me, south of third. I couldn't couldn't see that. The other thing, um, so in the four years that I've been there, I think that I've probably seen three accidents in that area. Uh, but since the barriers went up, I would see an accident at least every other weekend. And during a couple of weekends, I was seeing multiple accidents a day. I was only out there for an hour. Um, these accidents didn't, they were always, you know, just rear enders. And uh, the police were often not called, so I, I doubt that they were reported. Uh, I think the pump house probably got a lot of business because they'd pull over in front of the pump house and exchange information. And and then I, you know, I quit watching them. But um, so I don't know, it's just anecdotal. And, uh, but, uh, I think that something, if we were to do something like this, uh, we'd wanna maybe consider that there's information that wasn't recorded in traffic or police reports or time. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know where you'd get it if it wasn't anecdotal, but um, what I experienced differs a little bit from what I'm hearing. Good that's feedback. Thank you. Yeah, that's good feedback. And I think what we did what we did not mention in this, I think maybe in the full report, but what we really did see was there were conflicts at the merge point, whether it was direct, you know, rear enders or fender benders or not even that much or just, you know, people bumping each other, or if it was a little bit of road rage, we did we did see some of that where the where there was the where there was the merge point and Tyler and I, quite frankly, and Jim and, and other folks on this line, uh, we really fought hard to try to get it so it was more uh, so that the merge points were places where it really made sense for where traffic would be pulling out anyway. Like at third, when you're going northbound on Main Street, we really thought that it would be probably better for folks to go all the way up to third and be able to. That's your decision point of maybe. You have a lane that drops or turns onto third, and then the then the inside lane would continue going northbound. And and we had some businesses, you know, south of third that really needed really needed that outdoor space to to be viable. And they were one of some of the most positive businesses that we heard back from actually about you know being able to cover their yearly rent and what we did uh, or what they did over the over the summer a couple months there during the summer. So. Um, yeah, to do it over or to do it on a permanent basis, uh, we would work on really minimizing those conflict points so that they weren't as severe as they were and making more signage that would really talk about going all the way up to the to the point of the merge. We had a lot of places where, like you mentioned, David, where, it, where it, you, know, you had stacking back further than we'd like to see, and that did impact some traffic signals, so thank you. Great, good feedback there. I do remember the question I was gonna ask now. I, I don't want to lose sight of the importance of um, 
the unexpected benefits of removing the parking uh, um, off of that section of, of Main Street, uh, just that the concept of removing the parking and removing the buses there and pushing that on over to uh, uh, to Kaufman, um, I, I think very likely contributed significantly to the improved uh, traffic flow there. So uh, whether we continue with two lanes in each direction or, or, or not, uh, the buses and parking, I think, are definitely uh, an important thing not to, not to yada yada over. So um, anything else before we jump on over to the neighborhood traffic mitigation program? All right, well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tyler and, and Phil, and uh, we'll uh, hand it back to uh, Tyler and, and, and Carolyn. Yeah, thanks. So just so I think you've probably all mostly met mine, but um, Caroline's going to kind of walk us through, I guess, the the impetus for, for talking about this is I think that, you know, this is something that you've had an interest in. We've talked about, we've we've provided some information to the board about the traffic mitigation program before. And I think based on some of the discussions we've had, I, we want to bring this back to you, give some information for those that have not heard about this before or may not know about it. And then talk about some of the next steps and things we'd like to do. And Caroline, if you're ready, I will um, queue up. The yep. Okay. Yeah, Hello, just to introduce myself, my name is Caroline Michael. Um, I'm in engineering. I work with Tyler. Um, I've been to some TAB meetings before, and I was last here in um, October with the crash report. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about the Neighborhood Traffic Mitigation Program, kind of an overview of some of our challenges we want to do in the future. You can change slides. So, the Traffic Mitigation Program. So right now, the program we have was adopted in November 2006, so obviously over 10 years old now. But what was really done at the time, we really wanted a way to open up some communication between city staff and um, residents. And it was really focused on um, more of a of life piece. So if you can move on. So we kind of have two processes in our current neighborhood traffic program. So one is a city initiated and another is a citizen initiated process. Um, with our city initiated process, we rank all of our neighborhood collectors um, in a prioritization table. Try to choose our projects based on that table. And that's based on a number of factors, volumes, speeds, um, crash incidents, and um, a lot of times we also follow the pavement overlay schedule as well, because it's the easiest time to address some of these things. And for our citizen initiated process, that's get started when we have an application from a resident usually. And on that application, that resident has to identify the street, the boundaries that they would like to see addressed, um, and they also have to sign it themselves and get signatures from by other um, people from different households on the same street. So you can't have three people from the same household signing it. Um, and we have a threshold currently for the citizen initiated projects. And we kind of apply this generally with our 750 vehicles per day threshold. So street have more than that volume would be eligible for our physical mitigation tools, which would include permanent speed radars and speed tables, among other things. And less than that, we typically would not consider a street for physical mitigation tools. So the current program has a lot of challenges. So like I was mentioning before, the streets that are most time to address and make a lot of these improvements is doing during pavement overlay. 
with the pavement management program. But um, a lot of times those schedules don't mesh because our priorities are often different than their priorities. Um, and sometimes if we try to do it outside that process, especially if say we want to do new, then there could be some cosmetic issues there as well. Um, another problem is low resident engagement with some of our city initiated efforts. Um, so back in the pre-COVID time of February 2020, um, we wanted to kickstart a process on East Fifth Avenue between Alpine and Pace, kind of over by Rocky Mountain Elementary. And um, it was actually a joint process as well. So we were also going to look at East Fourth Avenue Street. Um, and they were both going to be undergoing pavement management. But um, when we had the initial open house, we had low turnout. I think two residents ended up coming. And then offline, I think I had two or three others. There wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for it. And we ended up canceling the project. So sometimes I don't think what necessarily we would rank as like an important project. Um, I think for a lot of different factors, sometimes that doesn't translate to what our residents are interested in. Um, another is the sort of cumbersome application process. So with the citizen initiation initiated programs, we also have an additional petition. They have to fill out and get even more signatures to prove kind of some neighborhood bond with the process. And um, right now, especially because it's all offline, so we don't really have a nice centralized way of doing that or a centralized way of really accepting applications. Right now, how it is, you can sort of turn an application. Um, city growth. So right now we're seeing a lot of growth in the residential areas. And right now we have um, a stipulation in our design standards that new streets are to be designed with slow points at 500 foot spacing. But what we've been seeing, even if we construct streets to the standards, you know, we're still getting calls after these streets are done. I just moved in, please put in a speed bump. So it's sort of awkward to explain to people, well, your street was already designed with slow points. We don't necessarily want to go back. You know, when we have all these other streets we want to address as well. Um, sometimes we have mitigation that doesn't meet expectations. So the last city initiated project we did was on left hand drive between South Sunset and South Bone Street in 2019. Um, and there we tried a different design of a speed table that was designed to have wheel paths for trucks to get through to kind of um, help out with some of the emergency response questions like I'll address later. But um, that was not successful. The design did not end up working out. And we got some feedback from it and we had to go back and actually re- construct that to our typical design. Sorry about that. That's the PowerPoint there. But, um, and again, there's projects we've done in the past. So one that comes to mind is Mountain View Avenue between Airport and Hover has actually gone through a traffic mitigation process before. And we have some permanent radars out there, but we still keep getting calls for the street. Um, I wasn't around for Initial process, but um, again, with the emergency response, I think there was Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, there is that fire station at um, Mountain View and Hover, which I think might have been part of the reason um, we maybe were more and put in some of those speakers. Yeah, so I think one of the things to keep in mind is this is not just, uh, um, I mean, if we were. As engineers, if we could design it in a, in a vacuum and say, this is the solution, we can solve the speeding problem. And we might be able to do that if we build big enough speed bumps and make it painful enough to drive through. I think the reality we're faced with is that meeting the needs of everyone, right? And one of that comes up is it, speed speed tables, we call them instead of speed bumps, they're a little bit different design. They, they, they do have an impact on 
on speeds and actually do slow people down. So I think that it's not just not just cars, but it also slows down that emergency response. So definitely something that's part of the picture when we're looking at what can we do and how do we how do we implement this. There there is a real impact to some of those emergency services as well. Yeah, and um, especially when we're looking at areas with um, schools. So that was something I was thinking of earlier this year because Rocky Mountain Elementary is right on East Fifth Avenue. Okay. Question: Do is there any demographic data available in terms of infractions? What categories or age groupings or things like that to overlay on some of these issues? Um, what do you mean by infractions? Well, speeding. If speeding is the primary okay. piece of safety, can we say that eighty percent fall between eighteen and twenty-two, something like that? I don't have. So I have crash data. I do not have data for speeding tickets. Okay. Um, Anecdotal. Yeah. So we typically do any anytime we're doing a mitigation project, we do data collection um, before and after. So we do a measurement of what are what are the speeds. I think there's definitely a different perception and. Um, a lot of times standing next to a car that's going 25 is maybe different than driving a car that's going 25. So I think things to keep in mind, obviously the, and, and I'm a parent of a toddler as well. So, right, someone speeds down the street and you say, hey, speed or slow down, right? Um, so I think the, we, we, we collect that data to have a baseline to get a, um, an angry parent. The car's probably, to me, going faster than it might actually be. So we do some data collection to try and measure that so we can get it. Um, perspective of a condition mm -hmm. on the street. And um, so part of the reason we're doing this is um, kind of to show what our challenges are. And for 2021, we'd like to start sort of maybe working parts of this program. So one of them, I think, is probably to get online. Right now, it's all, it's all hard copy. And I don't necessarily want to get rid of that option. Um, I think the technology literacy gap does exist, but um, I think getting online would just sort of um, maybe increase some participation. Um, updating of the toolbox that we have right now, maybe both level one and level two. Um, a lot of those level one strategies, honestly, I've never really used um, like the neighborhood speed pledge and maybe some of those things bring back because a lot of the speeding in neighborhoods is from people that live there. But um, there's other things that I we also get asked for a lot that aren't necessarily part of speed management strictly. Like we get a lot of requests for rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which we typically have not included as part of the process as that's more of a pedestrian control. But um, maybe looking at things maybe a little bit more holistically as well, and keeping those things in mind when we have these, um, especially some of these pavement overlay projects. Um, and also just sort of a overhaul of the process. So the, right now, the city of Boulder, been, I've kind of looked at Boulder's program and I wanna look at some other programs as well to see how they do it. So um, like a, can, how our process is set up I can receive an application really at any time. Um, and I'm currently not receiving applications um, at any great rate. I've had one recently. But um, the way Boulder does it, there's just an application deadline where it's like anyone can sort of turn in your application by the state and, you know, to be considered for next year's kind of like work projects. So just some more, maybe some more organization in that way, I think would be helpful. So I think and that's what we're really gonna, I had. Sorry, Ty, was that? So I, I think what we're gonna do is look at some of the other uh, surrounding municipalities and see, reach out and see what's working or not and and work to improve our process. I think we're, we acknowledge our, our program is, is probably, it's a little dusty, dated 2006. So I think it's in need of an update. And I think 
some of the takeaways we'd ask this board to um, provide some feedback on some things that we should consider or if you have suggestions on how to improve our process or make it better by all means please please provide that feedback it doesn't have to be right now it can be over think about it and get back to us as you wish and feel free to email or call caroline or myself and we're happy to to have a discussion awesome thank you thank you caroline i appreciate that yeah uh... We can maybe take it off of the uh, slides there and invite uh, any feedback from uh, uh, TAB members. Yeah, Courtney. Yes, Caroline had mentioned level one and level two, but uh, I was wondering what the definition of those were. So in the program, level one constitutes a non-physical which the two most common non-physical tools we have. We offer free um, slow down yard signs they're the purple ones. You've maybe seen them around. We also have um, some portable speed radars, so like the trailers that we can go set out on streets by request. And some other things we can do is maybe just some additional regulatory signage, like some speed limit signs and things like that. And level two would constitute more construction or physical tools. So like I said, speed tables is the most popular request. Um, also, concrete extensions, um, maybe even a traffic circle, something like that, if it was appropriate. Awesome, thanks, David. Um, and this is just this is primarily for the benefit of the newer members of the tab. So, my from at least the way I'm remembering things, uh, which could be incorrect, but it seems to me that. Of the public invited to be heard um, that we've received in the last two some years, mm -hmm. uh, the folks that have been there to complain about road and and speed conditions have been Mountain View between Hoover and Airport. So, despite the fact that we haven't figured out how to fix it, I think we need to keep on it and keep and try something. You know, try something else. I don't know what it would be, but. Folks are coming out of their homes, coming to this meeting to tell us about it. And I think that uh, we, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but we, we need to keep it on high on the list. Mm -hmm. So Dave, just real quick and for the benefit of the group, one of the neighbors that we've definitely talked to many times there on Mountain View, one of the requests has been for improved head crossing there. I think that is one that's a school crossing across Mountain View to get up to um, the school up on Northwestern. And as of about two weeks ago, we do now have one of those, uh, the Caroline mentioned before, the RFB, the Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon is installed there so that it did, so to address the ped crossing concern, we did do that. Great, thanks. Good, thanks. Um, all right, quick comment uh, for me there, and then uh, we'll jump to Sandy after that there. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Caroline, thanks for being able to ha have a chance to uh, to run through that. I think it's great that you'll be able to look at some different peer communities and see if there are any lessons learned or 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 good ideas that may be worth repurposing here in Longmont. Um, there, uh, three quick thoughts. First, I I hope as you're considering uh, what the future process looks like, anything we can do. To, I know they talked about kind of reimagining the process. I would take a step farther to say, is there a way we can simplify the process? Because it seems like there are an awful lot of steps along the way, and I wonder if that becomes a challenge for the staff perspective to even manage all those different touch points along the way. That really limits our ability to address some of the other, uh, even if they're not complaining on a regular basis there, they're still feeling mm -hmm. the pinch points there. So maybe if it's a streamlined process there, that will allow staff to be able to to address you know, more than, than just one or two or three streets uh, per year. Um, so one, one quick thought. Second quick thought is mm -hmm. in the table that you provided um, in in uh, the materials, um, I did not see any reference to um, uh, the width of the road or just other unique uh, circumstances. I happen to live on Francis Street mm -hmm. and it's an unusually yeah. narrow road. So you have basically cars um, right up against, at least on the southbound side, right up against the sidewalk. Um, so it when you don't have that extra ability for that extra buffer of parked cars there, uh, the cars that are coming by feel that much closer. And as we're starting mm -hmm. to think about how do we get more people to 
to be walking, how to get more people out of their cars to consider bicycling, being able to um, uh, to think about some of those unique circumstances are, I, I think, important for us to. Uh, I'm not sure how to be able to weight that, but maybe in the table mm -hmm. there's a way yeah. to, be able to have sort of unique circumstances uh, that may mm -hmm. warrant uh, lowering or raising priorities on the table. I think is 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 worth considering. And, and last, I, on the list of um, whether you call it level one or level two in the future, or, mm -hmm. or whether you simplify in, in some other way, um, I didn't see reduced speed zones as being even an, an option on there. Maybe I overlooked it there, but I but I hope you at least mm -hmm. consider for communities or streets that do have some unique circumstances to at least um, uh, to allow a reduced speed zone to at least be an option that staff and, and the neighborhood can consider um, as you move forward. So some quick thoughts. Great. Other comments? Sandy? Carolyn, um, thank you for your presentation. I was just wondering, um, in the neighborhood process on um, 4th Avenue, East 4th Avenue and 5th mm -hmm. Avenue between Alpine and Pace that you talked about, and there was low response in the neighborhood. Do you think it's because you, I don't know if you do this or not, but do you lack um, outreach to the communities um, to try to see what their needs are? Or you guys started this and then the neighborhood didn't see it was a problem? Or what, what was that about? Yeah, that's an interesting question and something I wonder too. So we did, it was a city initiated, so mm -hmm. came from our end. It wasn't driven by, you know, I didn't have, you know, some overwhelming number of, you know, complaints about East Fifth Avenue. It was, and then we sent, well, we started with sending out like a mailer for an open house is usually how we would start that process. And, you know, just very little turnout. And it did include um, a Spanish translation as well, but. Yeah, typically, typically our notification process is, is uh, we try to be conservative with the area and pick a larger area than we think is impacted, but it's generally a, a letter mailed to each house and, and or property owner if it's a, a stay a rental or something. We also contacted the school district for participation as well. But I think there's absolutely, um, I think, as we look at how do we improve our our outreach throughout the city, our communications, I think we've definitely worked with um, our public outreach team to try and improve that process. But I think there's always room for improvement. Awesome. Thanks. I, would agree. I think there's always room for improvement for engagement. And like you said, Neil, um, the sort of cumbersome process is something. I'd maybe like to streamline as well. So, sounds good. Awesome. Well, we'll keep marching forward here. We'll look forward to you coming back to uh, the TAB so that we can uh, hear some of your conclusions or recommendations there in the months ahead. Um, but appreciate you planting the, the seed for future conversations there. Nicely done. Thanks, Carolyn. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Um, comments from board members there. So we'll just do a quick uh, uh, fly around here. The time we have remaining to see if there's anything else uh, that is uh, top of mind. Um, we'll start with you, Jacques. Uh, anything? Uh, well, we'll go uh, Jacques, then then Sandy. Uh, anything top of mind for you? Yeah, just really quick, and this is kind of off transportation a, a little bit. Um, when we're looking at the charts for the downtown and the pedestrian uh, traffic, it was very startling uh, to see the huge drop in pedestrians in November and December, um, and it just reminded me that. Every decision that we're making here, we should keep this in mind that we have a lot of community members who um, rely on some of the decisions we make for their livelihood. And uh, I myself went downtown this last weekend to do some shopping. And um, I just I, I hope that we see an uptick in that because I know those businesses are probably hurting based on that data. So that's all. Great. Thanks, Chuck. Sandy. Um, it was a good meeting. Thank you for all the work that you've done. And I'm amazed uh, the amount of things that got done in spite of COVID. You um, moved through things very well. I went to the virtual meeting for um, bus rapid transit on uh, November the 12th. And I, I'm trying to wrap my head around 
how we're going to do massive transit through on 287 through Main Street when we're looking at getting all the traffic from the buses onto um, Kaufman Street. So I, I just am trying to figure out how all that's going to work together. And I'm sure it will, but uh, I don't know how that is going to happen. So I'm going to leave it to you all to figure it out. Thank you. If I can just interject, that's why we do want to put those buses on those separate separated lanes so they have their own busway to kind of do all that activity. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Let me go to uh, Liz and Joe. Thank you. And that was a great, lots of presentations, lots of good information. Um, the thing that's on the top of my mind is when you think about Main Street in particular, but all of the different streets is to bear in mind accessibility for people with wheelchairs or who are blind, things like that. I, a lot of this sounds like it could be difficult to navigate or hard for people who have difficulty walking to get to where they need to go. And I want to make sure that that's remembered. Good point. Thanks. Joe? Um, I don't have anything additive at this point that hasn't been touched on. Awesome. Uh, Courtney and then David. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for all the information tonight. I also attended the October 12th uh, regional bus meeting and I thought that was uh, very informative and a good start, at least to looking at regional transportation as a whole. Um, I know it will impact how we see that here in Longmont, but it seemed to be a good start for seeing how many people use the corridor and uh, that that people are starting to look at the corridor uh, in a bigger perspective. So, thanks, David. Um, well, I'm, I'm thrilled with the amount of uh, work that continued to get done despite, despite uh, all the challenges we've had in the last couple of months. Um, one thing I would like to hear on maybe uh, maybe at the next meeting is uh, status on where we stand with uh, quiet zone designs and implementation. Sounds good. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Only thing I'll add is um, it can be frustrating seeing how long regional um, and 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 um, key sec intersection uh, traffic planning um, projects can take. You know, measured in years, sometimes longer. Um, but when I think ahead about you know the long term benefits and 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 positive impacts of of getting that transit. Um, um, you know, transit station there over at first and main. Uh, I think that can that combined with, you know, some improvements on, on main street that we talked about earlier um, and uh, being able to get um, those improvements on Kaufman. I think those can really be transformative and yeah, it's going to take time, but I, I really think that uh, some of the decisions and, and some of the, the improvements that we're talking about are, are, are going to fundamentally transform Longmont in a really positive way and one that we can all be proud of in, in the years to come there. So thanks to staff for your good work in marching that process forward and uh, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, Council Member Peck, um, anything uh, on your side? Uh, not really. I just want to echo what uh, everyone else has said and to uh, Keep praise, I think, on our staff. They do just continue to work and try to work, uh, solve problems, and I think they're doing a great job. So, um, thank you. Sounds good. Totally agree. Um, awesome. Are there any upcoming transportation related meetings that are on the radar that uh, folks want to keep others in the loop about? Yeah, if I could just mention, uh, it's pretty important. I'm sorry I didn't mention this earlier from items from staff, and I'm glad you asked, Neil. Um, tomorrow is the uh, East County Line Public Workshop, East County Line Road, basically the Longmont section from State Highway 66, basically down to the river, I think we're talking about tomorrow, down to the St. Green Greenway anyway. So that starts at 4.30. If you need any links or anything like that, I can certainly, I'll just send them out to everybody so you just remember that that's happening tomorrow. You can also join Wednesday at 4.30 and Thursday at 4.30 for the Erie section and the section between Erie and Longmont is on is on Thursday. So you can talk about the whole corridor if you'd like to uh, during these three meetings or just the Longmont portion tomorrow night, right before city council. Sounds good. Thank you, Phil. 
Any other uh, transportation related meetings on the radar? Great, or anything else pressing before we sign off? Okay, well, uh, for upcoming agenda, we know we'll be talking about our 21, 2021 work plan uh, at the January um, advisory board meeting. So uh, definitely be uh, good to do some thinking about some of the priorities that you'd like to see addressed um, on, on the agenda here in 2021. And with that, I hope everyone has a uh, wonderful holiday season and we'll look forward to seeing everyone in the new year. Thanks everyone. Consider the meeting adjourned. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Hey Stacy, good job.